Well, hello everyone and thank you so much for coming. As you know, we have uh, an ongoing tradition in this university to invite guest speakers from a variety of companies and today we have an honor to welcome Mr. David Lee, who is the president of Arctico in Georgia. And so he's going to give, give you a brief introduction about the company and then you, you can go ahead and ask questions. Thank you so much Mr. Lee, the floor is yours. <coughs> Uh, the model of the design this was uh, made by David Lee, learning the cell bar. So the Dihani is a whole lot of promotion, Sakhar Kawashi. Made by uh, Mike Comis, President. I have been with the Lord Sally, Mike Comis, General Director. I have been with the Sakhar Kawashi. Paris Rebels is Shenley, then Afa, and many of the program may lead to sort of cycle travels. My diploma is called the DD Communications Company, Cycle Travels. Then many of the program at the Center of Countries, to many of the part of my diploma. So we start leadership by the Ashi. I meet some from my mom's sons. From my comrades, how was the video? How was the Medigari company? So for that, we had a lot of time to think about how they may have been sitting at home. He had the last Albert Trentin. Ben sau proti tam za situaciju. A hlavne stav lopka tu je da smo gram da se razdaje zneli. Ena da ne do pigro malo kiva upotabi. Čemu bi se vratio malo do Albert Trentu iz Rom. Mega vakito, kiva vakito je lekcija. English student. He met a Albert Rusulad English student. Got to let log in that. Ne, ukve je uplometi je ostati ostati je celi. Slišta me odsobnoti kipetaneci, Amerikanci, Evropanci. Mě bylo našel jamši, a ty celý. Mě jsem zrovna bugátor, mě byl bugátor KPMG. Tady mě komunikace je podle mě pomůžel D, pomůžel by upravenci od C cel. Ne vypadá Rusie, ale cel nebylo pár kopa, jaké bylo pár zkusit, že jen jaké bylo pár, jaké pár ruzenský sázel. Da se to dalo da Singapur, Yemen, já musel by Yemen si odchytali. Přesně si hold vys, že by musel so to the spheres, yeah, so to can't get the VC, so to the spheres, mobile telephone, mobile. So I'll switch into English for a while, and we'll talk about market leadership and what, what does it mean and how do you get there. You know, I'm talking too fast, just, just put your hand up, okay? Now I believe that a company's market leadership only occurs because of its managers, its founder. If you think about it, um, all the big market leading companies, they don't really have any specific reason to be the market leader. It's not like where 200 years ago and um, you have a patent on silk manufacture from China. I mean, or you own a big mine. Yeah, okay, but the main companies of today they compete, and uh, they don't have any patents really or any idea. 
that allows it to continue forever. So it's all about the managers. Even if you look at Facebook and you think about it, there are a lot of different social media applications that came out at the same time. Some of them before your time. But it was really the fact that that company had the better management. If you look at Google, they had the better management. So if you want to be a market leader, you need to really look at who are your managers, who are your founders, who are your people. Okay, because I know it'll be a lecture, I, 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 I put this up just to show that there are a lot of things you really need to look at internally and externally if you're a business school graduate. Who, who's business school here? So about half of your business school. So you'll be doing this at college. And um, I did my MBA at um, Warwick University in the UK. So there are lots of different systems, but in Macticom, we kind of boil it down to three things. We, we look at the output. What are we actually doing? Um, how, how efficient is that? Is it costing us more and more to do the same thing? Are we efficient? And then the last thing we look at is, is it effective? You know, are we doing things that actually work? In the old Soviet system, maybe you were making your quota, but no one was buying your goods, or you, it didn't work. And here in Georgia, there were factories that made things, tractors, and all kinds of things. But if it didn't work, that's no good. If you're not making any money, that's no good. And if the people don't want to buy your product, that's a disaster. So we look at those three things, and we measure them. But what we're really looking for at Magticom is we're looking for improvement over time. Uh, we don't try to do things for a year or for two years. We don't want to be market leader this month. We want to be market leader forever. Forever. So let's have a look at those areas. Let's have a look at output. One of the things I, I noticed when I look back, like 10 years, a lot has happened here in Georgia. Most of you are too young even to remember some of the things that have happened in the 10 years I've been here. But when we read in the, in the magazines and newspapers about these terrible wars and about all these problems and about Iraq and Iran and Afghanistan and the, and the, the situation in the and the occupied territories in Georgia and all the problems with Ukraine right now, the one thing that's continuous is that some businesses continue to grow. The worldwide economy has been growing for over 50 years, as long as I've been alive. I will guarantee you it will continue to grow in your lifetime. It doesn't matter what the problem is. The market will still grow. There may be problems, but if you know what you're doing as business school graduates, as technology people, there's always an opportunity for you. It isn't necessarily a problem for business that there's other problems. You should get used to that, not worry about it. So I looked at it and I thought, well, I came after the Rose Revolution, the country was a disaster, nothing worked. It was terrible. I mean, really bad. We're looking, you know, 10 years ago, I don't know if you would have been at high school or something, maybe. But I mean, it was very, very bad. In 2007, Everything was kind of going on okay, but then we had a very, very controversial presidential election in 2007. Everyone started to sort of get upset again. Lots of bad press, lots of conflict in the society. 2008, I was in uh, Magticon, and the government came and closed us down. They actually sent some troops and said, leave, May the 10th. Everybody left, except for five people, myself and four engineers, to keep the system working. I mean, these, these are big problems. And at that time, the entire communication system of Georgia on the Monday, when the tanks were there, it, it all collapsed. But Magticon kept going. We were the only telecommunication company that could keep going. So even in that terrible situation, Magticon actually managed to create some additional strength. Because we learned that our, our system worked, even when there was a war. So GeoCell, VLI, Silvet, all collapsed, but we kept going. We carry on and we look at 2012. I've said the new government in 2013 because with the new president now elected, we basically have a completely new government. But I mean, in October of last year, nobody really expected, nobody expected, if we're honest, no one really expected we would change the government. And in business, that has a major effect. That has a major, a major, major effect. But even though 
We had all this political change, even though we've got Russians on 20% of our territory, even though we've been invaded. This market, this market never went down. And if you actually look at a lot of markets, they continue to grow. Some industries have collapsed, some businesses have collapsed, but some things work. And as a business person in particular, that's your opportunity. Look for what's growing. I don't recommend you going to something that's going to get smaller, okay, at your age. Look for something that's growing. So, we've established that some things grow, no matter how bad the situation appears to be. And we introduced barley in 2005 for youth. We introduced, we had Beeline come in in 2007, a Russian company came in 2007. So we've been used to just having one competitor, and now we had two. And then we brought in Barney in 2010. So constantly innovating within our core market. Where are we today? Well, we're the market leader. We're the market leader by almost 10%. So Maxcom is bigger than everybody else. And that's one of the things I was saying. We want, to, we want to look at our output. How many customers do we have? Are we getting bigger or are we getting smaller? Okay, we're getting bigger all the time. That's where we want to be. But we don't want to just be big. While I'm the president, we want to be the biggest when he's the president or she's the president. Okay, we have to plan this future. We have to have a, a set of ideas and concepts and culture that means we're always going to be the biggest. All right, let's have a look at something that's not quite so exciting. <clears throat> if you were 30 years old, as I was in 1990, 24 years ago, and you leave KPMG and you go into a company that does mobile phones in Yemen, then you're going to probably be okay, because your whole industry is going to go from about 500 million people in the world to 6 billion today. So you're in the right industry. But even in industries that you wouldn't necessarily think have got any future, clever people can, can find growth. In, in the case of the fixed line market, in 2008, just before the war, Magnetikom introduced Magnetifix. Because what we realized was that actually, people want a mobile phone, but everybody actually wants a fixed phone in your house. And in Georgia, those of you who come from the regions, does anyone not live in Tbilisi? Your home is not in Tbilisi. A few, yeah. So those of you who didn't live in Tbilisi will understand that actually a lot of, kind of, a lot of homes didn't have telephones, so we introduced Magnetifix. And Magnetifix grew. And within about two years, we were bigger than SilkNet in terms of fixed line telephones. And we had found a way to get a fixed line phone into people's houses. It was innovation, basically. It was the idea that a fixed line phone really means a phone that doesn't move. You plug in the wall, and it looks like a phone, and it sounds like a phone, because it's a phone. But we used radio signals, an American radio system called CDMA, to get to that. And in terms of radio, we're by far the biggest. But even in terms of just the number of black or green phones on people's desks and businesses, we're bigger than any other company. Because we saw the opportunity, and we took it. OK, I'll stop talking about products quite soon. But what else did we do? Well, in 2012, we introduced MagTSAT. Why did we do that? Because we're always looking for something else to do, because we realize that any company that doesn't carry on developing its product line will ultimately fail. No one can continue to be the market leader if you do the same thing all the time. There's basically three ways you can do that. You can do something completely different, or you can do something that you're doing now but expand it into new areas that you're not quite covering. So we're basically in communications, which means less to, to, less to, less to television as well or you can increase your geographical coverage. But fundamentally, at the moment, Magticom is a Georgian company. So we don't have presence overseas like our competitors do. We only work here. We're a Georgian company. So we have to look at different things we can give to our customers. And one of the things we looked at was satellite. Now again, to go back to my theme of the lecture, leadership means that you can deal with problems. Problems can be a, a good thing and a bad thing. But generally speaking, the main thing is that you can deal with them. We put $20 million into the system, and when we launched it in January of 2012, because of the political situation, nobody would give us Georgian TV channels. We couldn't get Rastavi, we couldn't get uh, Imedi, we couldn't get any of the, we couldn't get First Channel. So we were trying to sell a telephone, a television service into Georgia that had no Georgian language. The only, only company that would do it was, was, was Maestro. So of course we had a huge problem because nobody would buy a system. And the way we dealt with that is we started a campaign. We started a campaign to change the mind of the government. 
to get the government to accept as a, as a fundamental principle, you have to allow everybody to see Georgian television channels, irrespective of who owns them, irris irrespective of what political inclination they have. It has to be a principle. And we love it here, we love it in, in Washington, we love it at the State Department, we love it at Carnegie, and we love it um, at the Atlantic Council. And we pushed and pushed and pushed. And eventually the government agreed that actually, yes, everyone in the whole of Georgia has to be able to see TV channels no matter who is transmitting them, whether it's on a, a normal TV set, whether it's on the internet, or whether it's on a satellite. And the minute we did that, as you'll see, we had this huge growth. And we're now the largest pay TV company in Georgia. And the lesson from this, again, was that it didn't matter how much political problems or problems with Russia or any other problem, if you really work hard, if you really try, you'll find a way through. The future, the future, if you don't already know, <laughs> is the internet. Your lives will be correlated directly with the developments on the internet. It is the defining technology of your age, of your age. When I came to Maxcom in 2004, we had 300,000 customers. And they all had mobile telephones. And that was it. The only thing you could do with a mobile telephone, apart from making a phone call, was send an SMS, which was kind of a newish thing. That was the only thing you could do. We now have over 300,000 people with phones that look like this. How many of you have a smartphone? OK. Those who don't, I won't ask you, because it's kind of cool to have a smartphone. But I mean, this thing is a thousand, I don't know. They're giving you one of these. If you work for banks, you get one. But, they're like a thousand lire, okay? Very, very expensive. This is a computer. There's 300,000, and the amount of data that's going over them is rising logarithmically. There are six billion mobile phones in the world. By the time you are out of this college and into your first, let's say, promotion at work, there will be billions of smartphones around the world. People talk about the Industrial Revolution, going back to the Agricultural Revolution. They talk about computers, and they talk about Microsoft, and they talk about how much difference computers have made to your life. Nothing, nothing will come close to what is going to happen in the next 10 years when everybody has not just a phone, but an internet-connected computer in their pocket. It will change everything. Six years ago, Apple invented the iPhone, six years ago. Even for very young people like you, that's not that long ago, okay? Facebook has been around three years. So everything is going to change very, very quickly now. And we have to take everything in that context. Matter comes the number one in mobile internet. So it's great that we're doing lots of stuff. I mean, I like that. It's all very cool. But for those of you who are business graduates, of course, it's no good just having lots of customers or lots of products if you can't make any money. So just to give you an insight into what we do look at, we do look at not just how many customers we've got, but how much money are we spending? How many people do we need to, to support that? And if you look at our figures, basically we do more with less all the time. But we have a huge advantage because our technology allows us to do more. We were the first people to introduce 3G in the whole region in 2006. It used to be that it was very difficult to get even like 100 kilobytes a second on a mobile phone. If I turn this on now, I'd be very surprised that Micacom's not giving me 5 megabits a second. I mean, if you get into the city centre, it can go up to like 10. We've got this, this, these latest uh, systems now, it's, it's just DPA plus. So that basically, we can do more, and we are doing more, but we do have to look at the numbers. It's not just about doing more and more and more for the sake of it. Now, perhaps the hardest thing we do is how do we measure effectiveness? What, what do we actually say? Are we effective at what we do? Is this university effective at what it does? How many people here think this is a good university? <laughs> how many people here think this is the number one university? Okay, so we're all talking about the same thing. I know about Magnetico and you know about this university. So we're all talking about the same thing. But you have to kind of be able to measure it. So I thought you might be interested in how do we do that. Well, we, first of all, we look at who are our customers. We have over 2 million customers. Over 2 million. Pretty much every house 
every community, every, every family in, in this country probably has something to do with Magti. Something. You know, you may not be Magti subscribers at home, but your brother is, or your uncle is, or, or someone is. You might not have Magti at home, but you might have a Magti, a Magti fix. You might have friends who have Magti sat, and you watch that sometimes when you're out like the Dacha or whatever. So, you look at our customers, and who are they? They're everybody. Company like MagtiCon, it's everybody. Our customer is everybody. We've got the young people, we've got the very young people, we've got people who are, who are parents, we've got people who are old people. And it's all kind of equally spread. And what we do therefore is we say, well, look, we're everywhere and for everyone. And in case you've ever wondered why we do this, that's why. We have three brands, the other people have just one. We do that because people want different things. So for those of you who are studying marketing, in my opinion, it really is this simple. Everybody wants something for the group that they're in. So in our case, if you want the very best, it's Magticon. If you're young, you probably want something that's fun, Bali Soul Spa, so you probably take Bali. And in this country, with the economy where it is at the moment, you have to respect the concept that some people really, really, really are tight for money. Some of you in this room will be here because of the financing plan that's in place. Some of you here can't afford a good farm. Some of you here, hopefully, um, will be in a position where these things don't matter. But for a country like this, there's always this idea that we've got to have a very good price offer. And that's why we brought Barney in. And Barney gives, we think, the best value in the country. But what's interesting, and not everybody knows this, is that the quality is the same for all of them. We use the same network. It's the same network. We don't have a base station for Bali and a base station for Bali and a base station for Magic. It's the same. We just added some additional features, like fun for the Bali guys. For the businessmen, we added a very, very good customer service when you're Magic. So that's the essence, for those of you who are studying it, the essence of what market segmentation is about. It's about giving people their own place, even if what you're really giving them is the same thing. Now, when I talk about price, ultimately, I don't think there's anybody here, well, let's try it. Can anyone here tell me of a very successful company that has poor quality products, or a good university, or a good place to go, or a good bar, or a good restaurant, or a place that makes good hachipuri? Does anybody know of a place like that that's cheap, it's successful, but it's rubbish? I mean, really. Has anyone got anyone? Yeah? <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, what's your least expected? I don't know. Yeah, okay, so I mean... We're not going to record that. We won't record that. Um, the fact is that quality, we believe in Mighty Call, that in the end, people will always stay with you if you have high quality. So our entire brand is about high quality. We do independent research all the time. And all the time we find that we outperform our rivals on quality. And I believe that's a very strong factor in our success. You have to have high quality. We use a, a technique. We use a technique that actually looks at would you promote our brand, a net promoter score. So we ask people, on a scale, would you tell your friends we're bad? Would you say they're not good or they're not bad? Or would you say they're good? And then we take the bad recommendations away from the good recommendation. And when we look at that, we find that on, on average, more people will say that we have the best service and the best quality than our competitors. And again, that's one area where we think that's extremely important. And as you look to any business, you've got to make sure that your customer will actually, actually promote you. That's to say, if, you, if someone asks you, yeah, you should buy this because it's pretty good. It would be the same with music, it would be the same with a car, it would be the same with almost anywhere you go. If you have bad quality, it doesn't matter how cheap you make it, no one's going to go. If there was a university in this city that was free, how many of you would go if it had bad quality? Would anybody go? No. You'd rather pay than come here because this is where you know you're in the best place in the city and everybody ultimately believes in that. So whatever you do in life, you know, you've got to make sure that it's high quality. Now, we believe that we're a leader because of 
because it's essentially three things. We have leaders who respect our country, our customers, and our employees. So we're now getting into very soft issues, okay? Things that are a little bit difficult for me to describe. But let's have a look at this. We believe that corporate strategy is important. You know, all this stuff about us having different products and how we measure them. But we believe that more important than our strategy is our culture. We believe we're successful because of who we are. So ultimately, that will also be your test in life. It won't be how clever am I? How good is my life plan? It will be how good am I as a person? How strong am I as an individual? Because we're all going to face these challenges. So let's have a look at Georgia. We're kind of an unusual company. We pay our taxes. For a long time when I first came here, we actually used to put into the newspaper how much tax we're paying. We're proud of how much tax we pay. We think it should be a bit fairer, but we do pay our taxes. We believe very strongly that as a Georgian company, we should help Georgia. Because if we don't, how can we possibly survive? How can we grow if, if Georgia doesn't grow? We only work here. So if our country is, is, isn't clever, if our country isn't strong, our country isn't rich, what can we do? So obviously we have to support that wherever possible. Now we don't just support, we don't just sell stuff, we don't just focus on what money we can make. We focus on this environment that we're in. Now on the business side, we're big supporters of organizations that help the business environment. We're big supporters of the American Chamber of Commerce. Because we believe that that organization helps us to find new investment. We're big supporters of EU GBC because we strongly believe, which your founder probably but it doesn't necessarily believe that Georgia should get closer and closer to Europe because we believe that's the direction that Georgia should move in. So we're very positive. This is a meeting in Brussels last week with the Minister of Reintegration and the, and the uh, ambassador, and ambassador to Brussels. We believe that we need to get closer to Europe, not closer to the North and not fully independent. We believe that Georgia belongs in Europe. We believe that Georgia is a Georgian state. And we're very active in promoting that. And finally, as a Georgian company, we believe in civil society proper. So this is, for example, the concept of democracy. And also, in particular, as a Georgian company, the concept that Georgia is one country. And we don't like this concept that we have 20% of our, our country occupying. So we're very active with organizations like Eurasian Partnership Foundation on peace building skills. Um, last year I was in, um, this year so I was in Abkhazia, I'll be there again next year, trying to work out ways that we can deal with the, the education system over there. We're working with young people, Georgian people, we're taking people from Abkhazia, we're taking people from Georgia, we're taking people from Azerbaijan and Armenia, and we're moving them to Turkey, and we're having group sessions like this with 30 or 40, sorry, with 120, 130 young people from each community. Because we very much believe as a communication company right now that people of your age in Abkhazia have to know people of your age in Georgia. Because right now they don't. Right now your contemporaries in colleges and universities, Georgians who live in Sahomi, do not know, do not speak to, do not have any contact with people from Georgia. We believe this is a very bad thing. And that's one of our visions, for example, of always having total coverage. One of our visions of using satellite initially, rather than just internet cable connections for our TV, because we want to get across the whole country. <coughs> and we take this very seriously. Okay, this is probably the single most important factor in Georgia today. If you look at what people say, they say the number one issue is the economy, the number two issue is, uh, is unemployment, and the number three issue is, is the occupied territories. But ultimately, the thing I believe is most important right now is what you're doing. I was very surprised today to hear from um, your colleague, I suppose, your, your, your leader, one of your leaders, that 98% of the students from this faculty get jobs. That is unbelievable. I mean, people from London School of Business don't have that kind of level. And yet, the number two issue on people's minds in the country is unemployment. That does not correlate. It does not correlate. 
the poor economy in Georgia does not correlate with the fact that people coming out of this university will immediately get a job. It does not correlate. That therefore the problem is the economy. No, the problem, probably, one of the biggest problems, is that we don't have enough people educated to a high enough standard. That's a problem. Okay? The problem is that I'm going to talk in English. How many people can really, really do that in Georgia? And you're going to have to be able to do that, okay, these young people. How many people are really getting a good education? And I see today you're doing your stuff in the science labs, and I see you here today. This is what needs to be done. Now, Magticom is involved in this. What we do is we give a stipend, but the university we currently support primarily is the technical university, the Subotologic Technical University, and the people from their technical department and from their IT department, we take the top six students from each organization and we give them an allowance each month, and we do that every, every four months. So we try to support them in that way. And we also have people come into Magnacom to get work experience. But that is the future of this country. The education is probably the number one issue, although people would necessarily say that in a survey. Another thing that's close to our hearts as a Georgian company is, is culture. We actually think that, that Georgia has a pretty cool culture. <laughs> um, Georgians are immensely proud of it, but we're also trying to balance this, because of the new world that's coming, into content, and we're supporting lots of these TV shows, and we have our own jazz club on Mr. Valley, and we're trying to get like the new culture and to, to develop that and get it out there into a, into a media format that we can use. And we're also looking at the, if you like, more traditional culture. We're supporting artists, we're supporting art galleries, we're supporting operas and so on and so forth. So we're very much into this side as well. Who are our customers? Well, we know our customers. It's you, I've already mentioned this. We know our customers and we're working with them. And perhaps we come towards the end of the lecture now, let's just have a look at our employees. I said right at the beginning of the lecture that everything really depends upon the people that you have. Now, all our employees, all 1,000 of them, are Georgia. And we're quite proud of the fact, except for me, <laughs> except for what? This is one, one non Georgia. But we're quite proud of the fact that actually for a technology company, about half our people are women and about half our people are male. And of the top guys, what we call the C level, the chief officer level, half of them are female. So I think, I think we're giving a good example there. As I look around this classroom, I can see that you have a similar sort of thing going down here. We pay a huge amount of money to train our employees. We pay our employees a decent wage, and we believe that's, that's another area where we've got be another reason for our success. Right, my final point today will be this quote from Machiavelli, which is that to change the order of things is perhaps the most dangerous thing we can possibly do. The greatest challenge for any company right now, and for you, will be how do we innovate? You know, how do we stay fresh? How do we keep ourselves the number one? And we'll all have examples of this, you know, which companies innovate and which companies don't innovate. But we believe that right now, people like Google and Samsung are innovating, and other huge companies have failed because they don't keep themselves alive, they don't keep pushing themselves. So, in all my experience, everywhere I've been being, all the different conflicts I've been in, I was in the Falklands when I was in the, uh, in the, in the, in the Navy. And in Yemen, we had a civil war, and here we've had a war, and I never expected that. But from everything I've ever seen, the whole theme of my lecture today is that actually what leadership is really, really all about is about never giving up. You know, why it might be strong is because whenever we actually face a problem, we manage to, to get over it. The one thing you can be absolutely sure of in the future is probably you know, two things. You know, one is the internet will dominate the opportunities in your life. And the second thing is that there will be things that happen that you cannot possibly expect. And your success will not come from what this university teaches you in terms of knowledge, but it's in terms of what you gain to strengthen your own character and your own culture so that you can deal with those challenges going forward. So thank you very much for your time. And thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lee, and uh, like uh
to start Q&A, so if students have questions, please you raise your hand. Go ahead. Please. First of all, thank you for the presentation. It was you. very interesting. And now my question. Well, as we know, Maticom is the largest uh, communication company in Georgia. Yeah. But as I know, in, uh, in Europe and in global markets, there are like large companies like Vodafone or O2 or AT&T. I have a question. Is, uh, uh, how, uh, is there a threat that Maticom one day will be taken over by these companies? And what can you do if uh, one of these large companies like Vodafone comes to Georgia? Because uh, I don't think that Maticom will have sufficient resources to uh, fight, to like, say, fight uh, of all these uh, large companies. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I understand your question. Um, there's a lot of um, work being done on this at the moment uh, in the research, yeah, globally. 70% um, of world GDP, I, 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 I've read, is actually generated by companies that, that are global by nature. It's very hard to believe that, but if you think about it, the cars you buy, the phones you buy, the almost all the equipment you buy, your kitchen or for your, your business, it's all made by global companies, so it's probably true. Um, but in most markets around the world, uh, the number one is a local company. All the top 100 companies in America and in Europe say that their number one priority, the number one priority, is expansion in a global sense, and particularly to developing countries, but all of them think that they do it badly. Um, there's a huge challenge for global companies in that it's very difficult to be global and local. If you look at, um, if you look at Magnicom's case, I've been here nearly 10 years and uh, Geocell has been here all the time. They are part of the Telius and Aero group. They have, I don't know, 50 different companies around the world. They're absolutely huge, yet we're bigger and we're richer than they are in terms of the market here. Beeline, as you know, is a very large organization. It's not as big as Telius and Aero, but it's big. So if Vodafone were to come, we don't believe that's a particularly bigger threat than, than GeoCell is to us right now. So our strategy is to make sure that the things we can do better, we do better. And of course, um, it's not really happened yet. There's been a few examples like Bojomi. But at some point in the future, definitely within your careers, definitely within your careers, some of the Georgia companies will become multinational. And ideally, someone in this room will create the first global company from a, from a Georgian base. So it sounds really scary. It sounds like, how can we possibly compete? But the reality is we've been competing ever since I've been in the GeoCell. And they are a multinational company, and they have a lot more resources. But we provide a service that the local population buy more frequently and pay more for than they do. So maybe that's just a good thing. One of the problems that we can overcome. But no, I don't believe it'll ever, it'll ever stop us. There's nothing out there that, that means that you cannot be, you cannot beat a big guy if you're faster and you're more attuned to your marketplace. Please. Are you planning to add support for LTE? Yeah, we've, got, we've already done the trials for LTE. Um, the, um, the introduction of new technology is something we do as part of our brand profile. We were the first with 3G. Um, the problem with LTE at the moment is simply there's not that many phones that use it. it it's not, so it's just not really available everywhere. In many ways, um, I personally am more concerned about not the speed of the download in Tbilisi, but the ability to get a high-speed download in the regions. That, that's something we worked on with our dual dongle, this little dongle we stick inside the computer. I mean, that's kind of a technology that will be replaced now probably by tablets, but I think more challenging for us is we provide the, we provide the uh, internet connection to 2,200 schools in this country. And what we're more interested in is using a mix of technologies to make sure that everyone can get a fast download speed than perhaps boasting that we have a technology that on Rusta Valley gives you, um, you know, 21.4 megabits a second. Yeah, that's cool, 
but wouldn't it be much better to say that everywhere in Georgia you can get a signal from Magazine and it stays 512 kilobit everywhere, all the time. So we're, we're, we're kind of balancing those two, two issues at the moment. The one thing we really want to do, we really want to do, is to, uh, is to start putting fiber optic cable into people's houses. Now in the past, it's been very difficult to get the permissions to do that. But that's been a dream of ours for quite a long time, is to basically um, to provide that service as well, which is a natural extension of the strategy that I've just, uh, you know, I've just shown you. I believe in the future that the, the, the defining thing will be the internet. You'll have to be on the internet all the time, wherever you are, and you'll want to have it available 24-7, whether you're in the car, at home, on an airplane, underground, on the top of a mountain, it'll be like oxygen, you'll have to have it. And, and that's more of the mix we're looking for. So what we want to be able to do is do it all. And we've got satellite, we've got mobile internet, we've got fixed. Um, so we need, we need a bit more fiber optic, I think, and that's the way we're going right now. Please. Um, I want to ask about marketing of Ma Amarticom. Uh, sure. Uh, to my mind, I think Geocell, Eura, and Beeline are more active uh, in this in marketing. I mean, um, TV commercials, uh, um, they, I think, uh, pay more attention. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Why? Because you are a leader in your mind? Then? No, no, it's more complicated than that. Um, I actually kind of thought the same thing as you did for many years, <laughs> and I had a lot of uh, arguments about this. Um, Magticom don't market in the same way as the other companies. We, 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 we're different. Um, we use the same sampling techniques, and we, uh, we do the same, like I said, promoters values, and we use big data, and we analyze what everybody is doing. But, like I said, there's a thousand Georgians in me at the company, and, and we have a big thing going for Georgia. You know, trying to have this uh, back it head. I mean, we, we really believe this stuff. And we're kind of proud of being Georgian. It, it's not a problem for us. We, we like it, you know? Um, I'm trying to be Georgian, you know? I mean, the rest of my Georgian. Um, we don't have a problem with looking and feeling Georgian. We're okay with that. So when we do an advert, we don't take an advert that was designed by an advertising agency from London, or even shot in London or Moscow and reconfigure it, the storyline and the people uh, for Georgia. You, you probably won't see a kind of a busty 19-year-old blonde girl on a beach uh, in a Mexican advert, you know? I mean, there are Georgians who look like that, but that's probably not what we're going to do, okay? We're probably going to show Georgians in Georgia doing Georgian things, whether they're blonde or they're dark or whatever they are, but we're going to do it that way, okay? We're not going to take another advert and translate it into Georgia. We're going to shoot it in Georgia. We're not going to find an American to write a storyline for how to sell um, smartphones, okay? We're going to go to a Georgian writer and a Georgian producer and a Georgian director and we're going to say, our guys want smartphones and they'll work out how to do that. But it gives it a different look and feel. I remember uh, when we did Bali. At the time, the situation for us was quite difficult for a number of reasons, but we wanted to do Bali. And I went to our advertising agent and I said, here in Georgia, and I said, I want to do Bali, and I want it to be different. Bali looks fun. And she said, um, okay, I'll make it different. I said, no, that's not going to work. And she said, well, yeah, well, I'll, I'll, I'll think of something different. I said, no, no, I, that's not going to work. Um, and in the end, after some arguing, she understood my point. I said, I want another advertising agency. You can manage this, but I want a different director, I'm a different producer, I'm a different writer, and I want different actors. And they came out with that Bali Sul Soir where they're all swimming in the pool. You see that one? They did like a rap there. Because you can tell, you know, that was a Georgian advert for young people, done by young people, and the other adverts previously had been done by slightly old people, but Georgian. And if you take the Western advertising and put it in here, it doesn't look the same. And, and that's not us, we're Georgian. You know, so that's why it feels too different. In terms of spend, we actually spend a very similar amount to, to, to GeoCell. GeoCell, Mag, to Beeline, put them together with the biggest advertiser in the country. So our, I think our marketing guys are as good as anyone else. But the difference is we're doing it here. 
and we like you that way, okay? Well, we're, we're cool with that. If you don't like it, that's okay, you know? Go buy some beer wine, but you know, <laughs> we, we, we're not gonna do that, you know? We're not gonna take some, I mean, from London, you know, I mean, come on, you know, London's a cool brand. Uh, I can find a hundred designers to do something that would be really funky, but I'm, 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 I'm Georgian. Thank you. Uh, any more questions? Yes, sure. Are you planning to officially go back home? Uh, yeah, we, actually, I felt a complicated issue. Um, about five years ago when they came out, Micticom said we would, we would like to sell this as a shop, and they said uh, Georgia's number 73 on the list. 73. So we'll get you whatever, you know? And, um, and at the time it was very frustrating because we were like communicating with them and saying, look, hang on, we're the biggest company, you know, well, well, well hell, you know, what do you want us to do? And they said, no, we're not interested, you know, we're, you're a little tiny country and we're not interested. And some other entrepreneurs have managed to somehow get in there and, um, and good. You know, I think that's maybe a good thing that maybe we didn't do that and now there's some other companies here they're doing the iPhone stores and things, and maybe that's not, maybe that was a good thing that we didn't somehow dominate that. Um, and also, in the meantime, right now, uh, Magneticom is much more focused on, on Samsung, because we, as I said in my lecture, at the moment we think Samsung is probably the most um, innovative handset. We don't make handsets, so I'm not going to get into an argument about this, but we kind of think that Samsung have a bit of an edge at the moment in terms of, of really being the market leader. You know, we, we like this at the moment, so we're happy to support Apple, but I don't think Apple is necessarily strategic to our, our plans, okay? In, in some ways, um, what I think I'm, I'm more interested in is getting the cost of, of a, a smartphone touchscreen down. You know, we've had some interesting conversations with people like Huawei, because ultimately, uh, what, what I want is that every single person to not only have a a touchscreen phone, uh, but also for us to be able to give you a download speed and a capacity that you can afford. That's my challenge right now. I don't really personally care if you've got a, a, you know, a Samsung Note or an iPhone or, a, or a, you know, a, an Amazon you know, reader. I mean, as long as you've got it, you've got something, and as long as I can get you data, I think that's the really defining difference for the, the country right now. Everyone needs to have a smartphone. Everyone needs to have a smartphone, and everyone needs to have a pricing plan that means you can afford to use it. And, and that's our kind of a vision right now. Uh, if I may ask uh, a question, uh, Mr. Lee, you extensively talked about the innovations. Yeah. And in, in your industry in particular, where things develop so fast, you, you really got to step up to a plate and be innovative in order to be able to be number one in the future. And I was wondering if you could describe the innovations process within your company. Would it be a, a, a team effort of a certain department? Or would people yeah, just come up with the ideas? No, we don't have it that way. Um, I think Nokia failed partly because they tried to uh, create a science out of innovation. I went to Nokia in 2005 and it was like the most fantastic experience. And you go to Finland and, and, and you go into uh, you go into their head office and it all looked very good, but actually they were analyzing everything to death. And, and, in, and in trying to focus on being innovative in the old market, they missed the whole concept of smartphone. Um, Magnacom, we did the dual dongle, that was the first mix of CDMA and 3G in the world. No one had ever done it, we did it with Huawei. Um, when, we, uh, you know, when we look at what we do, I think it could be more innovative. I don't think we've got that right. But the way we tend to do it is we do it by champions. So people will have ideas in the company and they'll push them. And if they break through, if they get their idea, what we call traction, as a company, because we're predominantly Georgian owned, uh, we can take a decision, a massive decision, you know, tens of millions of dollars in 24 hours. So if you, if you really do have a good idea and you push it, then we'll empower you to put that through. And pretty much all the ideas that have come through have been that way. Um, I mean, I'll share with you, it's, it's a long time ago, but when we did Bali, it was a struggle because Magti was market leader. The Magti brand was the number one brand in the country. Um, it was 
we had a 60% EBITDA, we were very, very wealthy. And when the idea came out that we should introduce a new brand, it was an insult within the culture of the company. It was literally an insult. You know, why? You know, why would you want to change our name? You know, this is, are you, a, are you an idiot? You know? um, and, but the idea had been born with a couple of young guys in the company. So at the time, we, we created a group called Fight Club, which is a movie. Uh, and, and those of you who've seen it, the first rule of Fight Club is you don't talk about Fight Club. And, um, and what we did is we put together a multidisciplinary team with a sort of protection, my protection, if you like, to say, look, develop the concept. And, um, and they did. And it introduced things which were innovative in themselves, okay, not like an iPad maybe, but I mean, um, the idea that you had multiple charging devices, so you could pay for money on, each, on, on different things, you know, for local calls, international calls, blah, blah, blah. And that, that model actually still sort of predominates, that what we do is we allow people to think that if they have a good idea, we won't sit there and analyse it, but we will listen. And if they push their idea, and if they can push it hard enough, then it will get through. And uh, Mighty South was born that way, Mighty Fix was born that way, Bali was born that way, um, the Jewel Dongle was born that way. It wasn't like an R&D department that came up with it, it was just young people saying, why don't we do this, you know? Not necessarily young actually, but people say, no, this would be a good business. And then taking the criticism, because one of the things about innovation is that the initial reaction in, in most societies, maybe not in, uh, in California, but in most societies, the reaction is, you know, that's not a good idea. It'll cost too much money. We won't get customers. It'll be too difficult. How, what about the technology? What about the company? You know, there's a thousand reasons not to do something. And when you're number one, you know, like Nokia, you can understand why you just go home every night thinking, I'm just the one I'm just fantastic. I'm just so good. And, and that's the thing that you've really got to, to guard against. But no, we, we, we don't have a special system for innovation. And I think we could do it better. You know, I definitely think we could do it better. This university we're looking at today, I mean, how do you get people to be innovative? It's, it's almost like saying, how do you get someone to be a genius? Or how do you get someone to be, to be popular? I mean, you can't really do it. You've just got to allow an environment in which those people can, can breathe. Uh, and that's what we try to do. But we, we, we believe that innovation is the core, the cornerstone of, of, of what we are, actually. Yeah. Thank you, and maybe one last question? Uh, maybe last question. Uh, maybe the young lady. Yeah, call centre is a problem. 
problem with the call center is that um, there's an unlimited demand uh, for, that, for that particular service. People just like to call up. And, um, and we just have this inevitable balance that we try to strike. If you wanted to answer every phone call that came into Magticom, you'd, you'd literally have to have like a thousand people in the call center at certain times of the day. Because it's just so easy, you go, oh, I can't make this, you know, and you call, you know. And um, there's a joke in a TV show in the UK, which is a customer service line for the IT department in a company. And when they answer the phone, they don't say hello, they say, have you tried turning it off and turning it on again? <laughs> okay. And, um, and then the, the new manager doesn't know anything about computers, but she starts off every conversation. Have you tried turning it off and turning it on again? So we are guilty as charged. Um, we do not have enough people in the call center. Um, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to, um, we have about 130 people. But what we're trying to do is A, explain things more easily, and B, use things like, whether we have a lot more people use our Facebook site now than any other mobile operator. We're trying to use ideas like that, like new, new media, so that you can share information, we're trying to make our branches more instructive, we're trying to make our adverts a bit more instructive, we're trying to make everything we do more logical, we're trying to put more stuff onto our website so that people can do that. And that is the future. One of the things that's surprising is, do you know what the customer service number is for Google in Georgia? I don't think they have one. I don't think they've got one anywhere in the world. All right, you know, a billion billions of people using that service, but, but you can't call them up. So it's a challenge. Um, and then the other question... Um, About the rebranding. Yeah, the rebranding. You kind of know when your brand is old, you know? You kind of just like when you throw out your t-shirt, you know, or you change your hairstyle, or... Um, there's lots of research on this. Um, and, uh, and you were expecting to come out with some kind of very clever marketing reason, no. I think, it, I think there was a time when we just looked at the brand and it was GSM and we were now moving into 3G and it was looking a bit flat and uh, what we actually did is one of our engineers, like innovation, he came up with a design, an engineer, 30, 27 year old engineers, people who like to play around with graphic design and he said uh, we'll just make it cubes and then when we did the different brands um, when we did Bali, the team, the Fight Club, actually came up with a lemon. They wanted it to be yellow. And um, when we gave the board presentation, I'd always told my guys, um, which is a standard sales technique, that if they start to talk about it in the sense it's already in existence, don't argue. So the point was that when we went down, it was, we want to do barley. And we knew, 90%, because of all this trouble, that they were going to say no. You know, we did it kind of secretly, it was ready to go. And we went down to the board meeting, and they said, um, you know, this is, the, this is our vision. Young people, they want different things. Barley so far, here's what it's going to look like, here's what it's going to feel like. But it was actually a lemon. And uh, one of the board members said, I don't like the lemon. I think a cherry would be better. And at that moment, my team stopped talking, as I instructed them to. They said nothing. Because we won. We won. You know, you can have a potato, but we need a youth plant. Okay. And then afterwards, they would thought it through. But I mean, the point was, you know, let's call it cartoffee. Okay. <laughs> Keep each, you know. Come at you. Yeah. But I mean, the point was that it accepted the concept of youth brand. And then, then you do your brand. But Google is a misspelled brand. You can spend an entire career talking about branding and kind of miss the point. You know, if it's not high quality, if it's not innovative, if you don't have good people, you don't know what you're doing, no matter how innovative your branding is, you're like a, these pop groups that make one good song, you know? And they live with you for the rest of your life, but it's one song, you know? And, and therefore, we just knew we needed to change the brand. We didn't go to an outside agency. We got someone in, 
I, one of our own guys came up with it, we looked at it. Um, I'll stop talking to but I mean like on the colour for example, when we were redesigning the colour, I remember uh, we came up with like a brown colour. And, and I remember having an argument and saying this is a ridiculous colour, but it, it, it eventually quickly worked itself out. But that's how we do things. And the last question was... Um, the, it was a more difficult like, profession. Yeah, actually we don't have that problem. We, we really, like I said, there's only one foreigner. <laughs> and, um, and we do everything ourselves because we have a brand name. Um, a lot of people uh, are kind of want to work with one of the big companies. Um, so we have a steady stream of people who, who apply to come to Manticon. And, and therefore, because we are in Georgia, actually the standard of the students at places like you, you know, you guys, um, you can, the, 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 the supply of young people is excellent, uh, particularly into telecommunications. We could probably do, the, 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 the country could do with more, but because we're the, the leading telecommunications, we get to pick the best of the crop, you know. So we're sort of okay on that. We don't really have a big problem. Um, but it is a problem for a lot of industries, particularly uh, sort of uh, sort of It's a big issue. You don't know enough trained people. Uh, I know that we have big problems with electrical engineering, all kinds of stuff like that. But for us, no. Ge Georgians and Russians uh, share a sort of um, trait of being extremely proficient, somehow genetically, at programming and uh, kind of natural affinity for engineering. It, 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 it's kind of somehow in the genetic makeup. So the, the best of those guys are, are brilliant. Like I said, we write our own building systems. I mean, that's pretty impressive. Did you want that just one, one question? Yeah, well, I think, I think the, kind of the vision I, I laid out sort of takes care of that. I said that strategy was important, but culture was more important. Um, I think that as long as we have this idea of wanting to be number one, and understanding that to do that we have to be innovative. And the fact that we have this very clear vision, you know, trying to cut back and back into it, you know, we know who we are. Um, we know what we want to be. We want to be the best communication company in the country. The only thing that I'm not sure we've really thought through properly, because we've always had something else to do, is do we want to go outside of Georgia? That, that isn't our strategy yet. It's not there. But it is a natural extension of the culture in many ways that to do Georgian business, maybe not today, but soon, will be to take the advantages of Georgia and to leverage them into, into a wider space. And some innovative entrepreneurs now are, are, are like selling wine. Marks and Spencer's now has Georgian wine in 120 stores. Um, Bourjolmi is making inroads. I mean, hopefully it will be us, but some other company will become, as I said earlier, the first company to, to become a multinational in a big way, you know, Georgian. Georgia company. There are other ones around right now, but so I think I think when I it comes to the three to five we plan no, we're not sitting there with a bunch of MBAs trying to work out where we'll be. And I think that's healthy. I think that's healthy. Because in this industry, like I, I gave the example, five years ago iPhones weren't around, Facebook wasn't around, tablets weren't around. I mean anyone who wrote a business plan in that period would have not had those document those devices on a on a, on a communication business plan. It wouldn't have been there. So much, much more important is this idea of flexibility. When I was in um, the Navy, when I went out to college like this, your age, um, you know, learning to be a naval officer and then to navigate helicopters. The favorite story in the British Royal Navy is Nelson during the Battle of Trafalgar. And his, um, his admiral told him to stop an attack where he was attacking the Armada. And he said, to his number two, he said, give me the telescope. And he looked at the telescope. And he said, I see no flags. I, they were used to signal on flags, he said. They used to put up, you know. 
And this one said, stop what you are doing now. That's an order, okay? But Nelson, before he was killed, had one arm and one eye. And he put the telescope to his wrong eye, to his bad eye. And, and that's culture. That, that's what they teach you as a naval officer, is that if you are on the ground and you see a situation that you need to do something, then you do it. Uh, and it kind of goes back to my lecture, you know. What will really get you through in life is your culture and your ability to never, ever give up. Because the one thing I can guarantee all of you is that in your careers, you will face problems which are insurmountable, impossible to deal with, and you really just need to go home and cry, you know? <laughs> and, and there are people in this room, part of your leadership, who have faced those things many, many times. And what defines the, the great entrepreneur, the great politician, and the great leader is not those that actually had the best idea or the best strategy, but those that just never get in. You know, they just never, ever get in. And, and that's my hearty recommendation to you as you start your career to go. Whatever it hits you, just stand up and keep going around. Just put one foot in front of it. Because with the talent and the expertise you'll take away from this university, there is literally nothing you can achieve. Well, thank you for such an inspirational lecture. <laughs>